Thanks for coming. Uh, I think I'm going to read from this book, Gone with the Mind. Um, Gone with the Mind is about, I, I really, that's a questionable word, I think, about with my books. Um, uh, it's a very indeterminate, fluid kind of idea what any of these things are, are about in that sense. But in this book, there is, there is a kind of uh, given, um, which is that, that I, uh, in sort of my present state, I'm, I'm 60, I am supposed to do a reading at a mall in New Jersey. And my mother drives me, which says something about, I guess, my feelings about where my accomplishments at this point in my life, that my mother has to drive me to my own reading in a mall. But uh, it gets worse, actually. We, no one, the, meeting, the, the reading is in the food court of a mall, and no one comes, absolutely nobody, zero. I thought that might happen. I've been waiting. In, in doing readings for this book, to do one where no one came, and that would be, I would then have been sucked into the vortex of my own book, but it hasn't, you ruined it. But, the, but uh, anyway, no one comes to the reading. There, there are two Panda Express workers in the food court who are sitting sort of off in the periphery. And I, I kind of pretend that they're, they're there for the reading and try to include them. Like, I'll say something and say, Right or you know, and they'll say we're not at the fucking reading. We're on break. You know, they get really incensed when I when I try to include them. So that's sort of the book. Uh, and uh, my mother introduces me for about forty, fifty pages, uh, talking mostly mostly about her pregnancy with me and what it was like to be a woman in the late fifties in in Jersey City, New Jersey, and be pregnant. And then I then I come on and really never get to the reading. I just sort of do what I'm doing now. I just endlessly contextualize the reading, but never actually get to it. And then there's a Q&A. And then there are no questions, really. My mother disappears, and I panic. And I you know, run all over the mall trying to find her, and find her in the ladies' room. And she's in a stall, and she says, come in, I want to show you something. And I don't want to tell you what happens. It's just spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> so there's an interesting character in the book called The Imaginary Intern. And I was going to read you a couple of little things about The Imaginary Intern. But I'm going to wait. And if there's time, let's see how we feel. I, I, there's sort of two little set pieces. I don't want to make this too, too long. It's in the middle of the summer and lunchtime in the summer. So I don't want to go on and on. Here, so um, I'm going to read you uh, a piece about a, a job I once had, and then I'm going to read you a piece about um, my urologist. Um, I have a picture of my urologist. I'll show you. It's a special treat for today. I'll show you that. <laughs> I'll show you that when it's time, when it's appropriate. And if, if when I'm all done, you're just dying to hear a little bit from, about the imaginary intern, we'll do it. Let's see. Let's see how we feel when it comes to that. All right. In the 80s, I had a job as a waiter at a place in Jersey City called the Summit House. And one of the first tables I ever waited on was a deuce in restaurant lingo. Uh, a middle-aged married couple for whom Friday night dinner at this particular spot was a custom, a ritual they'd really spruce up for. He, always in a carefully pressed polo shirt, seersucker jacket, and dark slacks. She, in some sort of floral print dress, pretty earrings, a pretty tortoiseshell comb in her hair, that sort of thing. Uh, the husband pronounced his R's as W's a speech defect called R labialization, most famously portrayed, of course, by Elmer Fudd. So this exceedingly pleasant, exceedingly soft-spoken guy would, each and every Friday evening, invariably order a wob woy, very dry, 
a warm and coke for my wife, the prime rib, very rare, and the boiled squad. And would it be possible for my wife to have that with weiss instead of French fries? He'd politely ask each and every time. I never questioned the authenticity of the order. Yes, it seemed improbable that someone who couldn't pronounce the letter R would never, just randomly in the course of events, order anything R less, say a gin and tonic, or a scotch, or a steak, or a veal chop, or spaghetti and meatballs, or a chicken pot pie. But I just figured he knew what he liked, knew what his wife liked, and that was that. He seemed like a perfectly decent sort of guy, and I had absolutely no reason to doubt his sincerity. And there'd always be dessert, the inevitable bread pudding and wed velvet cake, and at least two brandies, all of which added up to a hefty check for two people with a potentially substantial tip. So you want to be as accommodating as possible. One Friday night, this must have been after waiting on them for two or three weeks in a row, the husband asked me some variation on the question, assuming you don't want to be a professional waiter all your life, what do you really want to do? And I said that I wanted to be a writer someday. And he said that he and his wife love to weed. And I asked, who are your favorite writers? And he thought for a moment and he said, I love Joseph Conwad, Wayman Chandler, and especially Graham Greene. Now at this point, I remember I did look around feeling momentarily that I might be being punked in some way, in some sort of candid camera stunt or something, that someone had put him up to this. But again, I really had no reason to think, in fact it seemed a little crazy for me to think, that this seemingly guileless person was in on some sort of elaborate prank that was taking weeks to develop, and who'd want to do this to me anyway? I barely knew any of the other waiters or staff at this place. But still, no R-less writers? No Melville, no Poe, no Hemingway, just Conwad and Green. I mean, come on, what are the odds here? And I was just about to head back to the kitchen to pick up one of my other table's orders when the guy said, I also love music. I took a deep breath. Oh, I said, what kinds of music? And again, he thought for a moment or two, and then he said, I love the Wamones, Waxy music. And especially, and this he said in a much louder, more declarative voice, especially Guns and Woeses. And at this moment, I was positive that I heard people sniggering, that there were little contingents of my cohorts huddled in corners of the dining room, barely able to control their laughter. And I felt this radiant, heat rising from the back of my neck, and I felt as if my face must have been bright, bright red with humiliation. And although I never actually saw anyone laughing at me, I knew that they were. Who they were and why they did that to me, I'll never know. And yes, it's possible that a middle-aged man from Jersey City with our labialization could like Wob Woys, Prime Wib, Graham Green, and Guns and Woeses, but it's such a remote possibility as to be pretty much inconceivable. Someone or some people were behind all this, and their identities will also remain forever in the gnawing enigma file. And I also like to think that this particular event, I guess because I felt so abjectly alone, so on display at that moment in that dining room full of people in that particular food court. That this event not only instilled in me a wariness and a hypervigilance and suspiciousness and maybe even paranoia that have never abated, but also a weird masochistic love of precisely this sort of public humiliation. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's probably why we're all here this morning. And again, I'm extremely 
grateful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Now, um, this um, this is an issue of uh, I don't know if it's this year's, last year's, Best of New York it, uh, includes all sorts of categories. Here's a little section, Best Doctors in New York. This is David Samadhi, my urologist. I just show this to you so you can now visualize the person I'm going to be talking about. Dapper guy. Um, And when I started seeing David, Dr. Samadhi, and I guess he Googled me, I get, found out I was a writer and became interested in the notion of perhaps the two of us collaborating on his autobiography. <laughs> May seem odd, but so there were t sometimes we would meet at the bar at the Four Seasons Hotel, which was much more pleasant than, uh, you know, the um, you know intimidating environment of a of a doctor's office. Anyway, this is a bit about the two of us. Once. Samadhi and I were having a drink at the bar at the Four Seasons Hotel up on 57th Street near his old office. And he was saying to me, you know, once they're diagnosed with cancer, they forget about the blueberries and come to me. Referring, I think, to men who, when contemplating cancer in the abstract, are willing to consider all sorts of alternative treatment modalities, but when actually diagnosed with the actual disease and their actual bodies want the fucking cavalry called in. Samadhi's a very interesting guy with a very uh, Dickensian biography. He was born and raised in the Persian Jewish community of Iran and then after the revolution when he was only 15 years old moved to London with his little brother, just the two of them, completely on their own. When I met him he was the vice chair of the Department of Urology and the chief of robotics and minimally invasive surgery at Mount Sinai. And now he's, he's at um, Lenox Hill Hospital, where he's the chair of urology and the chief of robotic surgery. In 2012 sometime, I don't remember the month, I was diagnosed with high-grade capsule-contained Gleason 7 prostate cancer. And I pretty much knew from the moment I first sat down in his exam room and we discussed my situation that I wanted him to perform the surgery. Of course I got a second opinion. I went down to Johns Hopkins and consulted with a very renowned urologist down there. This is an episode that my mom and I have entitled Finger Banged in Baltimore. In addition to the eminent urologist, there seemed to be a veritable chorus line of interns, half a dozen eager young men lined up, snapping on their latex gloves, waiting to stick their fingers up my ass. It was like being in some sort of sick Busby Berkeley routine with a Giorgio Moroder soundtrack. All the urologists I've ever met exude a certain morbid elan. After all, their beau geste is the digital rectal exam. I became so accustomed to the procedure that once I, res uh, once I reflexively dropped my pants and bent over at the dentist's office. <laughs> the hygienist looked at me like, dude, it's just a cleaning. But with Samadhi, there's a flamboyance, a swaggering fighter pilot sort of bravado that I responded to very keenly. He really does possess this imperturbable aplomb and a kind of... Uh, I don't know any other way to describe it, a kind of star quality that inspires absolute confidence. We're there at the Four Seasons, at the bar, and he's explaining the anatomy to me. 
how the prostate is embedded within various crucial nerves that control urinary continence and erectile function. And he's joking with me that God put the prostate in such a difficult place in order to make it even harder for samadhi, to challenge his virtuosity. But he said that he, samadhi, was like Tom Cruise in that scene in Mission Impossible where, you know, the guy's dangling in midair by the two wires and without triggering any of the laser sensors, hacks into the CIA computer. In other words, Samadhi stealthily enters the body, deftly, delicately removes the prostate and gets out without so much as even grazing a single nerve, leaving you in full possession of your manhood and your dignity. And I was so inspired by what he was saying, by his zeal, his steely self-possession, his, his sang-froid, that and I'm not being facetious here, I suggested we just go into the men's room and that he remove my prostate right then and there. That's how charismatic he is. That's the complete, absolute, let's do this allegiance he instills in his patients. Granted, I had several cocktails in me. I remember... I remember thinking to myself at Mount Sinai, just as they administered the anesthesia, if you end up incontinent and impotent, don't be a baby, deal with it. And then laughing, that would actually make me a baby. I mean, those are pretty much the two key characteristics of a baby. And then waking up in what felt like an instant, in enormous pain, and with a catheter stuck in my dick, and like five big holes in my belly, like some innocent bystander in a drive-by. But the good news was, and I wouldn't know this for sure for a while, that I'm neither incontinent nor impotent, and all praise, all glory, goes to David Samadhi. I was extremely, fanatically devoted to doing my Kegel exercises, which one does post-surgery to ensure full restoration of urinary continence. I put my gym rat instincts, honed over the course of a lifetime, to good use here. I did those Kegels a dozen times a day, counted them off on a set of orange prayer beads that I bought just for that purpose. <laughs> I still do them, a set in the morning and a set before I go to sleep at night. And I now have, and I say this with a complete lack of humility, the strongest urinary sphincter muscles in the world. I think they will long outlive the rest of my body. In fact, you know how people say that cockroaches will survive the nuclear Armageddon? I think cockroaches and my urinary sphincter will survive the nuclear Armageddon. And I think that at some point, the cockroaches will ask my urinary sphincter to be their leader. I guess this is my own version of Manson's helter-skelter scenario. Because of what he did for me, I've got David Samadhi's back for life. I consider him my homeboy, and I consider his robot my homeboy, too. When old Yurok Indians get sick, eels, along with acorn soup and seaweed, are the food they crave. When I returned home from the hospital, I wanted peeps and peanut M&Ms, cocktail weenies and marzipan, but I was only allowed clear liquids at first, and then soft food, pabulum. Is there a is there a less virile look to present to one's wife than an open plaid robe, a catheterized penis, and a urine collection bag taped to your thigh? What can you do with this? I mean, fashion-wise. <laughs> Tape the bag at a sort of rakish angle? I would look in the mirror at myself and think, this must be the most abject, undignified, de-eroticized, version of a man possible. And I, I should read you the instructions they gave me at the hospital. There were like 23 pages of instructions. It was like a fucking novel. Take one Cipro two times a day, one Colace every eight hours. 
50 milligrams of low pressor two times a day, one oxycodone every four hours, plus applying antibiotic and lidocaine to the entry site of the catheter, rinsing the urine collection bags, repositioning, repositioning the taping of the catheter and the bag to prevent blistering, what to do if you experience abdominal distension, bladder spasms, bloody drainage, ankle swelling, perennial discomfort, scrotal swelling, painful sneezing, what to eat until you pass gas, what to eat once you have passed gas, when to call to get the results of the pathology report, about whether there's additional cancer in surrounding tissue, when to call to schedule the removal of the catheter. Anyway, Mercedes, Mercedes is my wife, Mercedes would bring me scrambled eggs and toast or macaroni and cheese or just pastina with butter or whatever and she would have made exactly the same thing for herself so I wouldn't be envious of what she was eating and I'd say you don't have to do this you know sit here with me and eat it it couldn't be all that appetizing and she'd say I want to and when we were finished eating, she would lie next to me, my catheter trailing down the side of the bed into that bag that I'd lay on the floor, and, and she'd hold my hand. And I don't think I ever felt more loved than at that very moment. It was just the most wonderful thing. Isn't it crazy that when I was in this abject, humiliating state. Somehow that week was a kind of honeymoon. Really, like a kind of honeymoon in Paris or something. It was. And if I were to make a coat of arms, an escutcheon, or, or perhaps a new tarot card to represent love, to represent caring, it would feature a catheter, a dish of scrambled eggs, and clasped hands. It was just the most beautiful thing anyone had ever done for me. It was the most romantic thing in the world for Mercedes, this sweet, sweet person, to hold out her hand to me like that. It was just the most... It was just the happiest moment of my life. Thank you. So, what would you like? I could read you about the imaginary intern or you could ask me some questions. I don't know if you do have questions about this. I think I probably covered it. <laughs> Comprehensively. But if you do, no, I'm joking. You may, you may have. What would you like? What time is it? How, how are we doing? Oh, okay. Let me, I'll do, I'll do these really quickly. Just to give you, this is a very interesting kind of phenomenon, the, the imaginary intern. I actually, uh, there was a bathroom in my, in my uh, house. I live in, in Hoboken across the river. And when I would sit on the toilet and look down on the floor, there was a tile and it was cracked and it was cracked in such a way that it looked like a, a face to me and the face became more and more real to me as years went by and became uh, someone I called the imaginary intern and who helped, would just help me with things um, I know, I mean this may sound crazy to you but there was something quite real about uh, the imaginary intern, and uh, um, I don't know, it may be symptomatic of, of maybe not growing up with a real brother, or maybe I need more friends, or uh, I'm just this very isolated sort of person, you know, a very insular person, but I really cherish this relationship, and the imaginary intern helped me a great, great deal writing this book. And then in the middle of writing the book, the imaginary intern vanished. And it was very sad for me. And a sort of tragic thing. And I talk about that 
in, in the book a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to read you four really little things about the imaginary intern. Um, just for a sort of clinical purposes, and this may be happening to a friend of yours or something, and this may be useful to you. Um, the, uh, here I describe how uh, the imaginary intern came to be. I was sitting on the toilet one morning, gazing down at the tiles on the bathroom floor, uh, just staring at the vein patterns and at the crack allure on this one particular tile, and I discerned a legible face. I discerned the lineaments of the imaginary intern in the crack allure of a tile on the bathroom floor. That's exactly how the imaginary intern was conjured up. This is a textbook delusion of reference, specifically a pareidolia, a psychological phenomenon that involves seeing meaningful patterns, frequently faces, in random information, a common example of which is something like seeing the face of Jesus in a cool ranch Dorito or something along those, those lines. And the imaginary intern initially functioned mainly as a kind of archivist or production manager on Gone with the Mind, helping me collate and categorize autobiographical material. But soon he became more like a, I don't know, more like a coach or a trainer. You know that term in pharmacology, mechanism of action? It's the specific biochemical interaction that basically enables a drug to do what it does. When you're writing something, its mechanism of action is a very difficult thing to identify. It's a very subtle, very elusive thing. But it really is the crucial fucking thing. And when I felt like I'd lost that, that I suddenly just didn't know what it was, or when you know, I just felt kind of discouraged or dispirited about how it was all going, the imaginary intern would exhort me. He'd pump me up. You know, he'd be like, Denzel Washington can land a plane upside down stinking drunk and you can't write an autobiography? A book about your own life? Are you fucking kidding me? So that, that's just an example of the, you know, the kind of real uh, exhortations and assistance I, I would get from the imaginary intern. And uh, I read a little se uh, section just to give you a, a sense of a, our relationship in terms of uh, it being a kind of uh, intimate or relationship, of, uh, you know, relationship of, of two close friends. The imaginary intern and I used to love this commercial for Dove Dry Spray Antiperspirant. There'd be a series of women and each woman would raise one arm in a gesture pretty, close, uh, pretty closely resembling the, the Roman salute. Spray on the antiperspirant, stroke her underarm with the index and middle fingers of her other hand, and then snap her fingers to demonstrate that the product goes on instantly dry. Both of us, the imaginary intern and myself, thought that it was exceptionally beautiful. And if he was watching TV and it came on and I was doing something somewhere else in the house, he'd call out. He'd call out, Mark! One time he actually called me tweezers, like the kids did at uh, summer camp. He was like, tweezers, the Dove commercial is on. And we started doing the gesture for each other, quick uh, swipe of the armpit and then the finger snap. It was a cute little thing between us, our, our little gang sign, I guess. But it's odd, as time went on, it somehow came to mean something much more to us. It, it came to represent, and this was a completely tacit understanding, not something we ever broached out loud. The gesture came to represent, to symbolize equanimity in the face of death. <laughs> and perhaps, and I say this in hindsight, perhaps even an infatuation with death. Um, the reading that I do in the book at the food court um, is part of something called, uh, apparently they have a reading series in the food court of this mall and it's called um, Nonfiction at the Food Court or something like that. So that's the series I was reading in it comes into play a bit. Um, the imaginary intern 
really did fervently believe, as do I, in this whole idea of staying secret, of shunning the spotlight. And a friend of mine once suggested that someone make a documentary about the imaginary intern, set up cameras all over the house, like in that movie Paranormal Activity. And I told the imaginary intern about it, and he freaked. He hated the idea. And I immediately regretted having told him about it. It was a huge mistake. And sometimes I think that that's actually why he left. He just wanted to be completely off the radar, left alone, completely inconspicuous, completely off camera. I don't know if he'd been abused in his life or what, but he just wanted to be able to relax and act as loony and as dorky as he wanted to without having to worry about what anyone else thought. And I think the idea of a documentary just really shook him up. It really spooked him. And I think I mentioned before that I've tried to reconjure his face from the configuration of cracks in the tile floor of other bathrooms. In fact, I was sitting on the toilet in the men's room in the Nordstrom, in this mall actually, and I thought I discerned his face in some crack allure on the floor. And I remember I was concentrating so hard on it, trying so hard to force a jumble of disparate features into a recognizable physiognomy that I was actually straining you know, pressing in that way that can cause hemorrhoids. So I had to stop. I've had that sudden, that sudden frisson, that jolt of, it's him, many times. And I'll squint, and I'll look from different angles, and it's inevitably a false alarm. It, it's not him. And it's, it's a big, big letdown. It really is. It's a shitty feeling. But that's what nonfiction is, people. Shitty feelings and encounters with death. And that's why we're here this morning. Thank you. Now, I want to read you one last little thing and then and we'll see. I don't know if you guys have ever run into people who do this cute sort of thing when you're talking to them, where if you say X, Y, Z, they'll say your X, Y, Z. I knew this girl who used to do it all the time. Like, I'd say something like, there's a hegemonic imperative in cross-training sneakers. And she'd say, you're a hegemonic imperative in cross-training sneakers. Or we'd be out at a restaurant, and I'd say, that pasta looks like a bowl of infant foreskins. And she'd say, you're a bowl of infant foreskins. <laughs> so once the imaginary intern said to me, and I don't remember what the context was, but he said that memory, and in a sense autobiography, is like a rash that blossoms and fades. And I said to him, you're like a rash that blossoms and fades. And then, after he was gone, I realized that he actually was like a rash that had blossomed and faded, an ache that time will never assuage. <laughs> Thank you. You're the greatest audience I've ever had. <laughs> As I expected you to be. Um, I don't know what I don't know what more to say. Do, uh, do you have any questions about anything at all? Oh, I think you have to you have to come up to the microphone. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> I missed the stop. Hello. Um, why did you decide to write an autobiography at this point? Um, Here's why. I, uh, 
I, when I'm writing a book, I, I look at my work in a way that may be different from the majority of writers. Um, I get the sense that it is. I don't, I'm not the sort of writer or person who thinks I have, there are things I need to get out, there are things that I need to convey to people, there, that I, or there's some sort of an inner narrative that I'm storing up that I need to, you know, convey in some way, or that I have certain incredible theories or sentiments that I need to convey. Books to me are always, I, I, I think I was very uh, influenced by when I was a teenager, or let's say 14, 15, 16, by the way, painters thought about their work and painters would think about doing a series of paintings with certain kind of technical problems or certain, you know, aesthetic technical problems that they were dealing with. And then another series would be somehow maybe a kind of dialectic with the last series or something very different or a kind of perhaps advancement on the ideas of that or something. And that's sort of how I think about these, these things. So. For the longest time, most of my life as a writer, I had very much avoided what you would call anything autobiographical, um, because I just thought that was the least interesting part of what I know or think about. Um, so I somewhat arbitrarily just embargoed all of that. And then uh, I had stopped writing a little bit and was doing sort of movie and TV kinds of writing. And then when I came back to writing books, I wrote a book called um, The Sugar Frosted Nut Sack. Um, and it um, had nothing of me in it. My other books had had a kind of very fictionalized version of me, um, very, very hyperbolic, artificial version of, of the I, the first person subject. Um, then that book had nothing of me. It was about a set of gods and goddesses and a person named Ike who believed, like was the only person on earth who believed in these gods and goddesses. Which as I point out doesn't mean they didn't exist. It just meant they chose to only be in the head of this one person. I think it's perfectly plausible that gods and goddesses would be, could behave that way, probably would behave that way. Uh, so this book I decided, let's, let me try to do something where I, I'm in every, in every something, auto, like see what, what, what was that fear or objection to talking about, you know, using, you know, we all have, we all, I really think we all have a kind of finite set of stories that retrospectively determine who we think we are, or how we present ourselves to other people or to ourselves, you know maybe 20 stories. I mean, you find yourself drinking is good for this. You find yourself telling all of them <laughs> in any g given night. After a number of hours, you will dip into those and exhaust them by 2, 3 in the morning and just start again. <laughs> so I, I used, I said, Let, hmm, let's think about that and, and use those. And, you know, you discover it's just, it's, it's just as interesting and uninteresting as all the sort of miscellaneous detritus that you use in your writing anyway. It's the same. You know, the sort of membrane that separates what you think of as yourself and the outside world is very porous and it's the same stuff floating in and out. And so why I spent my whole life avoiding it, I don't know now. But now that's out of my system, so. Um. So I think you just answered my question, so I'll ask a different one. Um, when you wrote the previous one, The Sugar Frosted Nutsack, when you started that book, how much of its structure did you already have in mind? Or did, it, did you already have it, or did it merge as you started writing? I, th um, that book, which I'm assuming, out of, out of my saintly humility that you haven't read, um, I had, again, I really, I have very, I don't know what you would call them, architectonic or geometric senses of books. The shapes, I really have an idea of what the shape of a book is, you know? And it's much more important to me than, than the story or the characters or anything. I had the shape of, uh, the, the shape of that book was a kind of uh, a vortex. And in fact, at the end, there's an image at the end of the entire book being uh, uh, embroidered 
around and around and around and around like a vortex in a, a baseball cap, you know, until you get to that little nub on the top and the book sort of ending there, you know. Uh, and that's, that's how I always imagine that book, s sort of spinning and spinning and then getting in tighter and tighter and tighter whirls of, of the vortex. This book, uh, Gone with the Mind, I had from the beginning an idea of doing a book in the form of a reading where there'd be an intro, in, in kind of three acts, that there'd be a introduction, the reading, and a Q&A. And I, I, have found, I, I have found, you know, almost no advice you get as a writer is, is useful, you know? And almost everything I've ever been told, I've been most successful at, uh, by doing the opposite. You know? And I still try to do that. If I show something to someone and they say, oh, it's too, it's very, I don't know, uh, it, it's pornographic. I just try to make it more pornographic. Or too self, it's self-indulgent. I make it more self-indulgent. Just do the opposite. Or it's too sentimental. I make it sickeningly, you know, like drenched in molasses sentimental. They're just showing me the direction to go to, you know. <laughs> and um, so, what was I going to say? Um, I lost my train of thought. What, what were we talking about? Because I, there, was a, there was a kind of advice someone gave me about this, and now I can't remember what it was and what I did opposite to it. Let me think for a second. If we're talking about this book. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me or not. Anyway. I wish I could remember. It was so, it w it was so brilliant. So <laughs> um, let me just think for a second about this. Um, so I think I've gone with the mind. I don't know. Lost it. Okay. <laughs> I'm a, a reliable uh, lecturer here. I half half demented. Can't even think of what the beginning of his own sentence was. Anyway, thank you so much for coming today in the midst of such an infernal day out there. It was great. Great to meet you in this forum. <laughs> <laughs>